If there weren't so many buildings, we could see it from the office window. And all it has is uh, just a landscape and a huge cathedral in the middle of the island. Google announced that soon Android Studio would support Kotlin development out of the box. We have never added a new programming language to Android. Did you hear the crowd? That was the loudest loudest That was the loudest applause. The most applause, by the way, by far, was for Kotlin. The story of Kotlin starts, I think it, I'm not sure I remember the exact year, I think it was the end of 2009. This started with the conversation that uh, I had with, uh, with our CEO back then, with Sergei Dmitriev. Back then we, have, we have been uh, building tools for programming languages for like nine years or roughly about that. And uh, we were always building tools for technologies that produced by other companies. So we did not have our own language, we did not have our own frameworks, and we did not, our, we did not have our own technology stack. And basically I thought like that it would be really nice, really interesting if we could do something more than just building tools, if we could just do something that actually moves the industry forward. And so that's how I came up with the idea that maybe we could build a programming language. So then uh, uh, some more conversations happened. Max Shafirov uh, got involved very early into the discussions of the language. And uh, soon after that, we got to know Andrei Breslov. So please help me welcome the lead language designer for Kotlin, Andrei Breslov. Thanks for a great introduction. Hello, everybody. I'm very glad to see you here. Today I'm going to talk about uh, what can it be, Kotlin, I guess. Yeah, I told this story many times already. So I was very skeptical, like from, from the very beginning of this conversation, I was, I was very skeptical. You know, it's a fairly well-known, like common sense thing that you shouldn't make new languages. Like it's, it's a hopeless thing. I joined a uh, Kotlin team very early, I think in 2011, when there were very few people there. And a lot of skepticism <laughs> also, uh, some skepticism inside giant brains and, out, uh, and outside giant brains. And I remember this uh, startup feeling when we were doing something great, but uh, many people wouldn't understand why was the purpose, why it can succeed and so on. By that time, I was already into languages. I... Like did a lot of domain specific languages. My PhD was about domain specific languages. Actually, my master's thesis was on domain specific languages as well. I assumed it was a conversation about a domain specific language project that uh, JetBrains was running for a while, MPS, which is a very interesting experimental system. And I was like, yeah, I'll be in St. Petersburg at some point. So at, at that time, I was uh, a, a visiting PhD student in Tartu. Um, yeah, I will be in St. Petersburg. I will just uh, pop into the office and we'll have a chat. Creating a programming language is, on one side, deceptively simple. Uh, there are lots of books on how you create your own language. And uh, that's for a software developer and a fun thing to do. You can do it as your pet project, create your own programming language. Uh, I mean, it's all more or less uh, standard computer science. So basically what a programming language is, it's a, an interface for a programmer to capture some ideas in a way that a computer can execute. So it's, it's not for, for a computer to understand, it's for a computer to execute precisely. So through a programming language, you tell the machine what to do in a very precise way. But what machines do ultimately is, of course, manipulations of like binary code, right? Bi- binary values. And you don't want to tell it like flip this one to zero uh, because it will be an incredibly long instruction like what you want it to do. And this is why modern languages are what's called high-level languages because we are describing things 
on a high level, higher level of abstraction, much higher than what the machine actually does. It's easy to create a toy language for yourself. Like I mean, some people do it as their uh, university project. Nowadays, with the tools that people have now, you like the simple, a simple programming language can be created just in a matter of a few weeks. That's all you need, right? You, you start working on it, you sketch some syntax uh, on a sheet of paper, you, uh, you're excited, you just start generating the parser. And then, uh, like, yeah, you, you, you can use this uh, like passion and interest to actually implement a compiler of some sort. But that's nowhere near a complete language on the one hand. You have to have a good quality compiler, you have to have documentation, you have to have some tools. Debuggers, profilers, uh, uh, libraries, uh, integrations. Everything from libraries to build tools to IDs to documentation and a lot, lots of examples and Stack Overflow and nowadays ChatGPT needs, needs to speak and so on and so forth. So it's like having a compiler is very far from enough. And uh, this can very quickly grow to a size of the project. And creating all of that takes a lot of resources and uh, quite a big team uh, to accomplish. So basically, it's an incredibly expensive project with a very low chance of success, even if you get all the technical things right. I mean, if, if it's your hobby and you just want to have fun, OK. But if you want it to be used by a lot of people, just don't do it. In 2010 to approximately 2015, I don't remember the exact date, I mean, by most metrics, Java was the most popular language. It was uh, widely taught in universities and widely used on backend. Mobile development was much less of a thing, so uh, my memory is a little bit fuzzy on that, whether we had iPhones already uh, back then. I think we did. The best Android phones of the year, I'd say the Samsung Galaxy S, the Droid X, and that Nexus One and Nexus S. Good work, Google. It's going to be well received, my, my opinion. Uh, we'll see whether that's this big or this big or this big. I, I don't know yet. It was a period of changes in mobile development because I'm a mobile guy. And I remember that BlackBerry was, was still one of the players. Stop asking for a recommendation between Blackberries because we can't tell them apart. Probably it was near the death of, of, of the BlackBerry OS, but uh, my first job was to port BlackBerry Java programs to Android, for example. Uh, so, and, and we used Java there and Java on Android. It, it was quite um, interesting. And most of the enterprise development was uh, much less front-end heavy than it is today. So there was, of course, already JavaScript and jQuery, but the modern frameworks such as React did not exist back then. And so much, a much larger percentage of the code of every enterprise application was executed on the server rather than on the client. Number one, the perceived popularity of jQuery is pervasive. The perceived, perceived ease of use. Java was a thing, .NET was a thing, native development was a thing, C++. The new Skype app for the PlayStation Vita. As you can see, it's been custom tailored to the PlayStation Vita's unique UI um, and makes full use of the 5-inch OLED display. By 2010, I think the up-to-date version of Java then was something like Java 6, or maybe Java 7 was right around the corner. And that wasn't a big update to the language. Like, uh, the, the actual meaningful, very interesting features that were uh, delivered to Java last were delivered back in 2004 with Java 5. I think that at that point, um, especially in the JVM world, in the Java world, uh, there were a lot of discussions about uh, alternatives to Java, mainly because Java was um, ki kind of a bit stagnating. There were many, many options of what uh, can be better than Java. And at that point, it was like, uh, I think, main competition between Scala, Groovy, and some others. Like at that point, there was Ceylon as well. If you go back to the internet in that time and see what people wrote, actually quite prominent people in Java community were discussing deficiencies of Java, that Java is uh, quite old. It was uh, 
more than 20 years by that time, where it was already obvious that it lacks some modern things people expect to, or and some of its uh, design choices uh, had proved already over 20 years of, had proved itself uh, n- not to be correct. There was lack of features, uh, lack of uh, some conciseness, and to some extent it's still there. Uh, so it's like people uh, saw how you can write code in Scala, and they is like, okay, why can't we do the same in Java? Why why do we have to to write that that much more code in Java for the same use case? And to some extent, it's still there. So, for instance, it you can't just throw away the language syntax and replace it with something else. For instance, with uh, t- um, compulsory uh, variable types. I mean, like in Java, you you can all you, you very often you have like variable name that duplicates the var- uh, the variable type, then goes the same variable type, and then goes the function like get the same variable type, whatever blah blah, blah handler, and it's like it it just repeating uh, this name three times. As an Android developer, I wouldn't say that uh, Java uh, stagnated back in the days, uh, but we. We couldn't use some fresh features on Android platform. We couldn't use new version of Java, and that was the main reason. Uh, and because of this, uh, we had to use some strange workarounds like Retro, retro Lambda library, uh, like Gradle plugin, which just uh, uh, transforms all all your code. As a Java developer who works in enterprise, I knew back then uh, that uh, in our Java code bases the major source of problems that we run into with our Java code was null pointer exception. And that was not just my experience, that was the experience of every uh, Java enterprise shop and people were invented horrible design principles to avoid those null pointer exceptions. Java had lots of known problems in its design and Kotlin was all about solving those problems. Yeah, it was my idea to for JetBrains to build a programming language. The specific language that we built, like how it was shaped and what it looked like was actually most most of these decisions were made by other people. So my role was kind of just the initial push. Every popular language is breaking this rule of never create a new language. And uh, popular languages are relatively few. I think it was either... Uh, Sergei Dmitriev or Max Shafirov, who convinced me that a new language was actually needed by the market, that there was a niche, uh, a window of opportunity that w- we could actually use and put out a language uh, that has a chance of being really successful, and that JetBrains was in a good position to do that. This was a long conversation, and it ended with, like, I was completely convinced that, yes, the language is needed, and... Uh, We were already brainstorming some ideas for the design on that same first um, day. We, like, on on the whiteboard, there there were some sketches of the syntax, so on and so forth. So it was sort of a very quick transition from, no, this is a very bad idea, to, okay, let's do it. It was a long conversation. I think I, yeah, I, I showed up at, like, six, and when I was going back, I was trying to catch the last train on the subway, so it was near midnight. And I did realize that there was a very huge risk of just, you know, wide adoption not happening. Uh, it was very clear to me, uh, even then at the beginning, and I was 26 by that time, so I, I had like, <laughs> I was overly self-confident. Uh, but even then I realized that, uh, yeah, this may not work out. Maybe we make a language and nobody cares. Maybe we make a language and it's not good. It's the first big language I was um, designing, so I had no idea if it would work out. But it, it felt like there was a need in the market, A, and B, it was worth a shot because I myself would uh, learn a lot from this, would try something really big, something uh, that I will be designing from scratch, and you know, it's it's an incredibly appealing proposition. You will be given all the resources to 
try and create a language from scratch and not a hobby language that nobody is going to care about, but a language that has a shot at becoming really big. I heard about it from Andrei Brislav. I made my bachelor and master degrees with him, so he was uh, my advisor for both degrees. And after I finished uh, the university, made my master, I was like, there is this cool project. <laughs> Can I join or something like this? first steps in designing Kotlin were basically just lots of discussions, I think, for about six months. All we did was talking. My advice back then was, okay, let's not just create a new language, but make sure we solve the problem of null-point exception in the language. And again, it was not a groundbreaking idea. Back then, there were a number of research languages who have successfully solved this problem. So, like, the key question would be, what do you wish Java had? Most of the things, actually, if you look at the Kotlin design, again, most of the things were there publicly, being publicly discussed by people. Uh, there were blog posts, people were kind of, kind of listing uh, deficiencies of Java. And what basically Kotlin did, it, it took those to, to the design table and uh, uh, put a, basically made a goal of making sure that all the existing weak spots of Java get addressed. An obvious idea was let's create a language where the right things you can easily do and uh, that's the bad things you can't do. So again, the whole idea was there on the surface. Of course, implementation is, is that what matters. Our goal with Kotlin was never like to break completely new ground. So a lot of the, a lot of the ideas in Kotlin come from languages that existed before, before it. Two main languages Kotlin was inspired with were Java and C-sharp. Scala was a very big influence. So I would uh, put it on the second place after Java. So Java was the biggest influence on Kotlin and Scala was uh, next. And we took a lot of ideas from it. The core routine design, which is a big part of the Kotlin, uh, Kotlin's feature set uh, was very heavily inspired by .NET and actually uh, many other languages have a similar design now. The syntax for passing lambdas uh, to a function where you can put the lambda outside of the uh, parentheses of a method, this was taken pretty much exactly from Groovy. It took the uh, idea of in-language DSLs uh, from Groovy, and Groovy at that time was not, was dynamic uh, language without static type system, and uh, uh, adapted it to a statically typed language, and it, that was pretty unique. So it's an actually really radical idea that lets you uh, kind of create new languages inside Kotlin, which is called domain-specific languages, and uh, makes solving uh, things in Kotlin, in many cases, easier and more straightforward than how you do it in, in other languages. Many ideas were taken from Python, things like delegated properties, so on and so forth. So we were taking uh, good ideas everywhere we can find them. And like smart casts, I think, were inspired by a language, not so well-known language called Gosu and so on and so forth. So, so there were interesting ideas we were collecting together, but it's not like you can just look at how it's done in another language and use it uh, like one-to-one -one because fitting features together is the hard part of it all. The harder thing is not what features to add. The hardest decision is what features not to add because you want your core language to be small enough so to make it easier for people to understand. It was another period in the programming language history where you could take some more ideas from the academic papers that were like incredibly convenient for programmers but weren't practical for languages of the 90s. So in, in 2010s, you could use things that were understood by researchers 20 years before that, 30 years before that, but only then it was possible to actually execute them in an efficient way. So this was what Kotlin was doing. We're taking ideas from basically 70s and 80s and 90s that there lived only in academic papers and academic languages and putting them into mainstream.
when I first saw Kotlin, it was still didn't have a name. It was still called the JET. For several years, uh, the packages in the Kotlin repository was um, had this JET. Was started with I don't JetBrains.jet, and there were some people in the community asking like, "What's what's this JET?" <laughs> And so, like, at some point, uh, Sergei Dmitriev uh, just came to my desk and uh, basically said that we need a name for the language. And this was, of course, not the first time that we had this discussion. This was discussed many times before, but he said just, we need a name for the language. And he was just standing there and not leaving. And I kind of thought that he would not leave until I have, have a name for him. And I thought that, yeah, well, Java is, a language, uh, Java is an island, Ceylon is an island, so we have an island of our own, which is called Kotlin. Let's name a language also after an island. And it's not just confrontation with Java, it's uh, because K goes after J. So, it's, uh, so the, the, the name has to, be, has to start with the next letter after J, not just to be an island. There is a place called Kotlin in Poland uh, that also makes ketchup. So I, sometimes I get souvenirs from uh, people from Poland um, just bringing me bottles of ketchup. One of the Kotlin design goals was interoperability with Java. The team not only wanted to create a new better language than Java, the team wanted to create a language which in which the code you write in Kotlin can nicely coexist with the existing Java code and libraries that you have. So you can use existing Java tooling for it. And that made design of them really complicated. It made finding the right solution really complicated. To make that work, you have to integrate with the, with the entire Java ecosystem, with every tool that works with Java, you need to integrate in one way or another. So it's, it's a pretty convoluted process to get Kotlin work with Java very well in every aspect of the Java ecosystem. I don't remember that we actually did have a big roadmap. I think there was a roadmap, but I think it was mostly in Andrew Belsov's head originally. Essentially, we had the design and we had to make sure that all the parts of the design were implemented and working and correct. And uh, a lot of the evolution after that was like, feedback driven or driven by issues that we knew to be unresolved. And, uh, but this was all very informal. And I think the formal roadmap process, like right now, as called, right, uh, right now Kotlin has a public roadmap, but I think this was a change that happened in the last like three years or something like that. I was basically putting together a list of things we could address and how we can address them and so on and so forth. I was looking into that uh, for a while and there were Two, inter or two or three internal presentations when we just gave an internal talk to everybody interested in GemBrains, and people were asking questions and giving me feedback. And it was very helpful, actually, to uh, just clean up the design a little bit and find issues that we didn't address. Kotlin was uh, through 2010 to somewhere around 15, was done by a pretty small team at GemBrains. Uh, and its initial conceptual uh, phases. And it, it did, it was kind of uh, slow, uh, but, the, but at the same time, the team was small, so it wasn't big investment initially. There were a few folks who were working on the compiler, a few folks, folks working on the tools. Uh, like the compiler team was like, uh, so Stas Hirohin, who, is, uh, who, uh, who has been working on Kotlin since then, and who I think is, uh, who was like the manager of the Kotlin team for some time, he was like one of the key developers on the front end. Sasha Odalov was working in the back end, uh, along with Dima Petrov, and I think there were a bunch of other people. I probably don't remember everyone. Andrew Breslov was a uh, team lead. He was uh, you know, managing the whole team and driving the language evolution. So we had very good people, but everybody was part-time, and there, there was like very little uh, full-time focus in the project. And we didn't bring many people from across JetBrains to work on this. So a few people joined, but we weren't actively recruiting people from around JetBrains, and we weren't actively recruiting experienced compiler engineers from outside JetBrains. There are experts in compiler development. You can't find them, but they're very far from it. It's a niche job. But on the other side, everyone, in when you're studying university and you study software engineering or uh, 
uh, computer science in university, you, that's one of the most obvious subjects that every student goes through is how to design and write a compiler. It's usually the course on compiler creation. Every student has its university. Hiring students and fresh graduates uh, is like something everybody does, of course, because uh, getting good people is difficult. Also, I had a lot of experience working with students. I know I knew like how to tell a good student apart, how to work with a student. So it was like my strong side. And also uh, it was probably just my bias. I knew how to do that. I had access to a lot of students. And I think it's a very good idea to have young, bright people who have a lot of energy on the team. And it's, it's, it pays off. Young people writing modern language, which is pretty fitting because we're writing a modern language in Kotlin, is uh, designed to be a modern language. But I guess our problem was lack of balance. We had too many uh, junior developers and too few experienced people who did production compilers before. So that was a mistake. And I think we could have uh, made the first release a lot sooner if we had more experienced people on the team. and. Uh, to a large extent, it's, it's a product of myself not being an experienced manager when we started. I was 26, I never managed a team, but I thought I knew how to do everything because I thought management was like teaching, which it isn't. I mean, it has similar aspects, but it's absolutely not the same. Uh, so I didn't realize I didn't know how to do it. I was doing it in a way that felt right. And I was completely wrong. I was micromanaging everybody. I didn't know how to hire people. I didn't know what kind of people I needed to hire. Um, yeah, so so a lot of mistakes in assembling the team. We ended up getting very bright people and the team now is very strong. It would have been in, yes, it would have been in 2014. So I'd been working in Java up to that point, but was getting tired of the syntax and its sort of fussiness, and, and you know, it's quite verbose. I liked a lot of the things about the ecosystem, but the language was getting a bit annoying. So I looked around for a better JVM language, basically. I looked at Scala, and I looked at Ceylon, which at the time was a Red Hat project that was kind of competing with Kotlin early on. Um, and I found... Kotlin somehow, I don't remember how, just found a blog post about it or something from, Jet, from JetBrains. And at the time, there was no website. There was just a Confluence wiki page that was <laughs> like publicly readable. And it described you know, this language, which I thought sounded interesting. And I tried them all out, uh, but decided early on that mm, Kotlin was the one I liked, partly because I was already an IntelliJ user and Kotlin worked very well with that. Um, and so... I started using Kotlin around M10 or something like that, so the language was stable at that point. We have some people who uh, even put into their biography, I started uh, to use Kotlin when interfaces were called straights. Or I started to use Kotlin uh, from from this um, I don't know, M10 version. Uh, there were milestone, milestone versions. So it's like there were a set of milestones um, getting closer to the to the final release my first impression about kotlin was um it looks like java it feels a little bit like java uh it was very understandable for me uh but at the same time i found a lot of interesting features something fresh andre breslov came to me one day and he said hey so i've been accepted to speak at a conference in the u.s it's called oscon uh and they want me to give a talk about Kotlin. I can't go. Can you go? And I said, well, I, I, I don't even know what Kotlin is or what, how it's related. Or I'm a .NET developer and this is JVM. So uh, yeah, I, my journey with Kotlin started there. I'm learning Kotlin in one month and going into a presentation about it. So yeah, that's, that's a little bit about my background and how it relates to Kotlin. Why are you here? apart from the awesome title. Like, is it to learn functional programming? Is it to learn Kotlin? I was given a room of 800 people at OSCON. And OSCON, it was a, a, back then, I don't think it exists anymore, but it was a pretty big conference, right? It was O'Reilly's Open Source Conference. And uh, I think around nine people showed up. 
So I'm in this massive room and only nine people there. And so I'm giving this talk and uh, you know, the general question starts to pop up. It's like, well, why not Scala? This looks a little bit like Scala. And why this? And why that? And you got to understand that while I, I am and, and was even more back then a software developer, I didn't know the ins and outs of the JVM. I didn't know a lot of things. And I was basically given one and a half months to learn Kotlin, learn the JVM, and prepare a talk. Uh, so it was it was kind of challenging, right? Some of the questions that were being asked were, were challenging. So of course, the main when you're starting a project like that, like the main doubt is that no one is going to use the language. So, like for example, uh, we got quite a bit of pushback for from the users of Scala, who thought that yeah, well, Scala actually solves all the problems that Kotlin is intended to solve, and if Scala doesn't do something exactly right, that JetBrains should contribute to Scala so that these problems could be fixed inside inside the Scala language, and so why like they should not bother with building their own language. And of course, there were also worries that. They are just building, like, no one should use Kotlin because Kotlin is built for people, to, for JetBrains to sell more IDs. So that, like, you should avoid the lock into JetBrains IDs, and because of that, you should not use Kotlin. For some people, that was a concern. It was, uh, I mean, different kinds of feedback. Some people wanted features and were, right, I want this and that feature. And uh, most of the time, this kind of feedback non-constructive, but it still gives you food for thought, like, what's people missing? I mean, I think the Java community was a little bit split, and, and still is. First of all, there were, it wasn't just the Java community, it was also the, the Groovy community and the Scala community. When we introduced Kotlin, and then there was another language, if I don't know if you recall, it was called Ceylon, uh, which we actually had tried to work with initially, but they, went to the, they wanted to go a different direction than we did. But uh, so in the Java community, those folks that had ad adopted uh, Scala would look down on Kotlin generally, like saying, you know, this is just a, a, a dumber version of Scala, which is why I used to make the joke initially uh, when I used to present Kotlin and say, well, uh, Kotlin is Scala for dummies. You know, the, you know, the for dummy series books. Right. It's uh, so I used to say Kotlin is a scholar for dummies. Um, no disrespect to folks adopting Kotlin, including myself, but it was in line of the in line of that book. The core problem that uh, Kotlin and other JVM languages were trying to solve is let's have a modern language that works with Java ecosystem that uh, that is better than Java. Or, OK, not probably works with Java ecosystem, but better language for the JVM, for the JVM platform. And then uh, the core difference with Scala was that Scala wanted to re reinvent the world uh, with uh, its own standard library, with, with its own ecosystem, with its own uh, library. And they, they were more, more, more interested in a little bit of academic approach. Okay, what can be done with this new language on the, on the JVM? What, is, what can be the future of programming and so on and so forth? And in our case, uh, that, was, that were all the reasons why at JetBrains they couldn't use Scala. They wanted to, but then it's a, it was one of the reasons why uh, they started Kotlin in the first place, because they wanted uh, to have a new, a better language to write IntelliJ on. And at that point, as, as I said, Java was stagnating and they considered Scala, but Scala wasn't a good fit to mix with, uh, with, uh, with Java, with existing Java code, with existing Java libraries. What is your favorite non-Java JVM language? Uh, so that one's a pretty easy one, and that's Clojure. Oh, I mean, there's at least one person in chat who's going to be very, very happy with that answer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason for that is, uh, you know, I, I think Clojure is one of the few production quality serious JVM languages that isn't just let's do Java better. Even though it does uh, want to become a better Java but it does not do so by adding Java with more features. The, the way is different. Like even the way you declare functions in them is different, very different. Like you put types in different places, you declare different. So a different language that is designed to be better than Java. And so, you know, the folks in the Java community that were like, no, we want everything functional and we want to do the whole uh, FP and, and to hell with object-oriented programming. 
they were basically in the scholar camp. Then there were folks that were looking at Kotlin and saying, well, this is, looks a lot like Groovy, and you can add an annotation to make Groovy static, the type, so why are you doing this? And then there was a small portion of folks in the Java community saying, hey, this is kind of nice, right? This is, uh, it's reducing amount of boilerplate code, and uh, I like how this feature works, and I like that little feature, and I'm going to start trying it. I did different talks uh, at the time at Java conference, and I remember many people coming to me afterwards. It's like, yes, that makes sense. It's like uh, before the release, it was always like, okay, let's see how it all evolves. But uh, still, there was signs of uh, understanding what's it all about. What impressed me the most was that even though the language had almost no users and wasn't at version one yet, and so the syntax and semantics kept changing. Every time I upgraded to a new Kotlin release, there were like inspections in the IDE that would port my code for me to the new version. And so I felt immediately this gave me a tremendous sense of confidence. A lot of things that we had in the works, we had to stop working on, but we, we, we needed to stop it in a way that we can continue later. And the thing with languages is, if you put something out and people start using it, you can't take it back. Because if you take something back in the language, all the code that's out there will break. So no features disappeared, luckily. I don't, rec I don't recall ever betting on a feature and then it vanished. That would have been really painful, but that never happened, right? Um, there were challenges early on with bugs. So that showed through in things like compiler bugs occasionally or crashes or, or cases where the IDE would show good code red, for example, or red code uh, would actually compile. The way annotations work change. In, in modern Kotlin, they look the same as in Java, they work the same way. But in the early Kotlins, annotations, they didn't have um, an at in front of them, and they were designed to look like user-specified keywords, actually. And I remember when that got taken out, Andre, you know, one of the reasons I started to like this guy is he posted a blog post where he, he sort of poured his heart out a bit and he said, you know, I've worked so hard on this speech, I really fell in love with this idea of, of being able to like really extend the language fluently through these annotations that all work a bit like keywords. And, you know, it was so nice and it was elegant, but we took it out because we couldn't make the IDE fast enough with that feature. And, you know, that really, um, that really drove it home to me that these guys, this team, like Andre, is thinking about every aspect simultaneously. And that was quite an intense process. We spent like lots of time reviewing the design and doing everything like that. I remember the team was always stressed out <laughs> that they had to release it, release it soon. It's like, it's not yet there. So it's like, there was a lot of, and I, I remember I had this strange feeling because I was going to conferences and at the conference, usually there were people super happy, super enthusiastic about Kotlin. Mm, or probably only those will come to me after my talks to share the excitement. And then I went back to the office and I uh, saw these faces, uh, I don't know, under stress that <laughs> we need to release, we have so many problems. A special Kotlin cons for you. It takes uh, something about six hours to complete them. So there, there is a project with some tasks to, to accomplish. Then you can do a lo load and actually fix all tests. And uh, after six hours of hard work, you will be able to say, yes, I know Kotlin. Kotlin was always open to other users, right? It was, Kotlin was envisioned and designed as a general purpose language. General purpose means you can use it everywhere. It just the original focus of the team was the thing where people did experiments were either backend or desktop. Because again, that was, was the kind of code that was there at JetBrains. And that's what people experimented with and discussed on the design. And we were mainly targeting industrial developers, enterprise developers, server-side developers, people who wrote Java in 2010. This is the last session before you guys get your new toys. I mean, Android development devices, right? That's what you're gonna use them for, right? So we're gonna make sure we finish on time and you guys can rush down and get pick them up. I think it was like 2012 or something. Uh, somebody asked a question in our forum. Hey, I tried to use Kotlin to compile some code from Android and I, re I ran into this compiler. Bug. Does Kotlin even work on Android? And I was like, I don't know. 
Probably you can try, it should work, <laughs> but please try. I was not really keenly aware of Android. I knew there was this interesting new platform that Google was putting out, but I never looked into it. I heard that it used Java. I didn't even know how it was uh, implemented there. Originally, Kotlin was not planned as a mobile development language. So the interest in mobile development came up later uh, because users were interested in it. Users were uh, interested in getting a better language. And I guess that mobile users were all in all less conservative, less set in their ways uh, compared to like backend developers who also used a lot of Java. And so they were more open to trying out a new language and Kotlin was the language that they wanted to try. Yeah, somebody tried at some point and uh, it turned out that nothing worked at all. Like the code didn't even run uh, because there was some, some segmentation fault uh, which crash from somewhere inside the Android tool, tool chain. And we were like, okay, uh, <laughs> now, uh, now what? <laughs> there were no mobile developers in the team and nobody thought that we were, we were doing mobile development like we should have. And uh, uh, the adoption of Kotlin on mobile or Android uh, was, was kind of excellent. It, the, what the community brought to Kotlin, not the part of its original design. And uh, the team looked at it and they're like, okay, well, this isn't the big issue. We can fix that. And we did. It turned out that the Android toolchain itself crashed the uh, DEX. It's a translator from the Java bytecodes to Dalvik bytecodes. Uh, Android has its own virtual machine that's sort of compatible to Java, but doesn't use the same bytecodes. Uh, so this translator, uh, written in C or C++, just crashed, um, uh, just uh, fell into a core dump. And that was what we got, like a core dump with uh, just a bunch of registers. And I guess some diagnostics about some kind of flags not matching. We realized that this one was a problem in our compiler. We were actually writing some flags onto our classes that were not legal for Java. And at that point, it was quite clear that the world is not as nice and simple as we thought because we were running Kotlin on the hotspot VM from Oracle that was, back in the day, developed alongside the Java language specification. And it was not uh, implemented like word to word to the spec. Because again, a lot of that code just predated the spec. So Hotspot didn't care about some, some minute discrepancies from the spec that we had in our compiler. But Android was written later and they cared about every detail. They actually read the spec and implemented everything. And we looked at it and yeah, there's a compiler bug. We are going to fix it here. Have the fix. You can try it again. And the person said, that, oh yeah, something's working now. And this is basically how Kotlin for Android support started. Noise that the Android community was making, noise in a nice way, but like there was so much talk about Android and Android and Android and Android that it ended up actually kind of backfiring for us because people started to think that Kotlin is just an Android language, that the only thing you can do with Kotlin is mobile development. I associated this language with the mobile and I didn't try to use it um, for some other platforms. This wasn't, this wasn't a vector as such, so mobile development was not Mobile development was not like a big area of investment for us or something like that. So we were still building Kotlin as a language for everyone, for backend developers and for mobile developers as well. And for a long time, we had like one or two people working on Android specific. Yes, we were getting users there. We were addressing the pain points of those users, but it's not like we were just uh, officially, officially saying that this is our main target audience now and we have to deprioritize other directions. <laughs> um, of course, Android community, um uh, was happy <laughs> because Kotlin is great uh, programming language which brings uh, a lot of interesting features which we can use right now without any issues out of the box and uh, like Kotlin was like fresh breath of air and later on uh I realized that Android was a very interesting market for Kotlin because uh, the, my idea was that mobile applications are often created from scratch. There are many more smaller projects and new projects started from scratch. And it's much easier to adopt a new language when you start from scratch than uh, 
if you, if you compare that to having already having a code base and a team working on a code base, introducing le- new language is uh, much more of a challenge. So I uh, made a bet uh, to support Android well to, uh, to target this specific use case. You start a new application from scratch, and uh, this makes adoption of a new language much easier. It turned out this factor wasn't very important, but Android was an important platform. So I'm very happy I made the decision back in 2000, I don't know, 13, 14, probably 2014. Yeah. It was the perfect fit for that time because they also wanted a modern language, a new language and um, new features in the language. If they could use Java, it probably the, the, the demand would be lower, but because they could not, uh, they and still wanted to uh, to have joy from the development to be able to use new features or that other la- other ecosystem and other languages were talking about a lot. Uh, there was uh, this clear demand. So the community started to grow, and then what happened is that you know people started to get interested in Kotlin on the Android side, and then there was this famous paper by Jake Wharton, who I'm sure you know. Uh, that's well known in the Android community, and he wrote this like long white paper about how he was proposing and wanting to adopt Kotlin at Square, which is now named Block. And at that point, because he was very well known in the Android community, and his opinion, and like many people listen to his opinion, is like it became it strengthened a lot our message. So this one k- k- kind of. Not luck, but kind of luck that at this point they made this decision. Because if they haven't done this, if, if they made a different one, if they decided just to to stick with Java using, I don't know, some improvements, some libraries, uh, there might not have been this outcome. And at some point I remember I'm like, you know, I've created a Slack channel for this product that we have now, which is called Ktor. And uh, I said, you know, maybe we should generalize this Slack and rename it and uh, open it up to Kotlin, not just Ktor, which we did. So we went over and then suddenly it started to grow. You know, and right now, I think we've got something like 67 or 68,000 people on the, on the Kotlin Slack. And of course, some of these users got interested in Kotlin because they're like longtime fans of the company and they were interested in everything that, company, that the company used to build. But I kind of think that most of the like early promotion in, outside of JetBrains was done by people new to, to this whole thing, to were probably IntelliJ users, but were not as active in the IntelliJ user community, but were just started the community activities when they started using Kotlin. On many occasions when I was asked like, when are you going to release 1.0? And I was like, at least a year from now. And this at least a year from now uh, was repeated like year after year, of course, because this is not a plan, right? <laughs> I was the person who, because we, we wanted to have released earlier. And I sometimes say that I'm the person who was promising uh, uh, the first release, the first Kotlin release um, in, a, in a year for three years, something like this. So it's like, I remember going to the conference and saying like, what, when do you expect the first release of God, the same release of God? It's like, probably in a year and a half. And then a year and a half passes and there was still no release, but then I still continued to think probably in a year. By 2015, we basically just realized, okay, we, we have to start wrapping things up to put it out next year. And uh, next year, the date wasn't set, really. We just started wrapping things up. Fast forward to 2016. I was excited, and it was an absolutely crazy process, but it worked. Like, in a year, we did release um, 1.0. And, uh, you know, as it usually happens, uh, the compiler that we were releasing it was initially written as a prototype. So the idea back in 2010 and 2011 was, le- was like, let's prototype a compiler quickly and see how things work and then just throw it away and write a good compiler from scratch. Of course, that very prototype is what everybody's using today. So the new compiler, K2, is around the corner. It's almost done. 
But it was only started, I don't remember exactly when, like 2018, 2019. But the idea was to do it in 2012 and it never happened, of course, because it never happens. So that's, that's another strategic mistake that um, I made. Andre promised it how many years ago <laughs> and it's only now here. <laughs> and then you can ask, okay, why it took so long to release the first version of Kotlin? <laughs> why it takes so long to release the second version of Kotlin? I don't know, it takes time. It's not an easy project. So yeah, in 2016, we released that prototype compiler as the production version, of course, and uh, the entire year 2016 was spent, of course, fixing bugs and then like addressing lots of issues, as it usually is with uh, fresh software. Yeah, it was quite an interesting time. So, uh, as for now, we have 1.0, actually 1.02, uh, as the main uh, release, and uh, our development is in two lines. So we have those uh, incremental updates. 102, 103, so on and so forth, which are source compatible, which means that language doesn't change modular bugs. We fix bugs in the compiler. This sometimes slightly changes the language, but that's always for the better, believe me. There was this illusion that as soon as we release 1.0, something's going to change. But obviously, this is not what happens usually, because after 1.0, we we'll started getting bug reports from more people. We look at uh, feedback people give, and uh, 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 there were cases where it uh, led us uh, to reconsidering the design. And it was a rush to fix at least the critical ones, because there were, there were things that people just couldn't compile their code, or their code didn't run, or something like that. So it was a push for 1.0.1, 1.0.2, so up updates that fixed critical bugs. And it was like an, a, a never-ending treadmill. Which led us to reconsider our approaches to you know, quality assurance, making sure we better test it before we release it. Like you have to fix issues in the existing code, you have to work on the new features that were planned. And it was just an everlasting process. There was a, a realism experimental, people critiqued it, said that, uh, you know, pointed out things that were not working, were really nice, and led us to revisit this idea and implement it in a different way. By the time we released, it was pretty clear that something was not right in how the team was managed. So I was, I think it was about 30-something people in the team by that time. And I was basically micromanaging everybody without realizing I was doing that. And it wasn't working very well. I was overloaded, I couldn't write any code. Uh, and actually, I basically gave up writing code uh, close to the release and never wrote any production code in Kotlin uh, after that. Team, Kotlin team since 1.0, it's since the moment I joined, Kotlin team grew rapidly. It started a really small team with some separation, like where they were not even formal, formal groups or teams inside. And yeah, it was a lot of like organizational debt in uh, how the team was run. And it was a slow process of realization that we need to change how it is and create sub-teams and do other things. It was pretty difficult. It all started splitting into compiler team, into ID team, into infrastructure teams. Then, you know, there appeared a formal quality assurance team. So in this sense, there was this kind of technical process, designing the language, implementing the features, talking to the users, uh, you know, presenting about the language all over the world. All that was going on, but there was also this undercurrent of restructuring the team. And it went on for, for a while because I didn't know how to do it. Um, so I we only figured it out years later. There was a little, just a little bit to ce celebrate and then just get back to work. As developers, we get the best work done when we just have the opportunity to sit down undistracted and get into the flow. Context switching greatly reduces our efficiency, and it can cause us a lot of frustration. How many of you would love to work in a world where you get to work in a consistent, expressive, concise, and fun programming language all day, both for the app development you do, as well as the tools to build it? I know I would. <laughs> Today, I'm going to walk you through this funner new language that some of you may have heard about by now called Kotlin and how it can help make your life a little bit better and more consistent throughout the entire development stack. Ever since we released 1.0, we were oscillating between two biggest issues. 
it's one or the other that's the hottest at the moment, and when you fix one, you get back to the other. It's ID performance, how quickly everything uh, responds in the ID, and build performance, how quickly you can get a, an executable uh, when you submit your code. Uh, so both weren't great, and our initial goal was to match Java, more or less, on both. And it's incredibly difficult. Kotlin is a more complicated language than Java. And also, just we didn't pay enough attention to it from the beginning. We didn't measure our performance from the beginning. And it was only later on when it, we realized that performance is something we really need to address and was very difficult to do it with an existing code base. So it was an issue from the beginning. And we were kind of uh, taking the hottest one, like the kind of users the build is the slowest, the slowest for, trying to help them when they are not really happy, but like not as in much uh, as much pain as they used to be. We switched to ID and fix things there, so on and so forth. So we were kind of oscillating between the two for a long time, and of course, underlying um, this was incremental compilation for the builds is very important in the development process was uh, like the feedback loop that the developer is working in is you write some code, you want to run it as quickly as possible. And if compilation takes a long time, that breaks your feedback loop and you have to wait and you have to go and get some coffee and your train of thought is gone and your context is gone. Uh, so yeah, we were investing quite a bit in incremental compilation. And it's a very complicated algorithm with a lot of issues integrating with the build system because we were also transitioning from something built into IntelliJ IDEA called JPS into, uh, onto Gradle. We're trying to do something in Maven as, ve as well. Maven is not very well suited for incremental compilation. So there, there were a lots and lots of technical challenges around that. Also, our prototype compiler wasn't very good for performance in the ID, so there were constant issues with ID stuff. So these things were constantly bugging us, and this is why we are now the team is working on the new compiler that will solve a lot of these issues. And also, like this is why a lot of um, optimization work went into Kotlin Gradle integration, both on the Gradle side and on the Kotlin side. It's been a huge project. And in 2014, I found Kotlin, and I remember, like the the front page of Kotlin had these sneakers on the photo. As like, uh, oh my like, god, this I is not that. professional, <laughs> but this coming from JetBrains, so I will take a look at it. No, I, I like Kotlin website used to be on Confluence, and and when I started to do like some helping with product marketing, I I put it over outside of Confluence. And I was looking for some hipster style image and I found those sneak <laughs> sneakers. One of our targets, one of our goals was to try and get some content published around Kotlin. And so I had spoken for a long time to O'Reilly, the same folks that had that had OSCON, and tried to convince them for them to allow me to do a course on their platform. Back then it was called Safari. And uh, eventually, I managed to convince them, and I created a, an eight-hour course on Safari, which still exists. It's still there, teaching the fundamentals and advanced things in terms of Kotlin. And uh, I remember, like, you know, I was getting a number of views on this. Right? It wasn't. It wasn't massive. And the my editor at the time, they were like, "Well, well you know, it's kind of like what we expected." And we definitely wanted more. We realized like the, the whole Java space was uh, in millions of developers, and we wanted to get to that. And it was pretty clear that Android developers suffered even more than regular Java developers because Android was uh, stuck in Java 6. They didn't even get properly uh, to use uh, Java 8 features. So they were still 10... 10-ish years back, basically, stuck with the language from about 10 years ago. It turned out that actual Android developers were really happy uh, to use Kotlin in their projects, and they loved it. But a lot of people were complaining about being just being unsure whether Kotlin keeps working on Android. But Because 
what if Google changes something in their platform and Kotlin stops working? For example, and people really wanted us to get an endorsement from Google to just reassure them and make it easier to adopt the new language in their apps. And we were trying to approach Google in different ways. We, JetBrains and Google had a good relationship working on the same platform for our IDs. Android Studio was based on a JetBrains ID, uh, and it was going on for, for a while by that time. Yeah, so we tried to contact people at Google, and it didn't work. Like, we didn't get any response for a while. The first uh, involvement, there was uh, this guy called Yigit Boyar. I don't know if he's still at Google. Uh, and he, I think he was the first Googler who actually tried to do things with Android. In terms of Google, okay, so the, the, the thing is, I do believe I have the first Kotlin commit in Android. Wow, <laughs> so really? I'm super proud of. I mean, didn't fact check, but it's very, very unlikely someone else merged in the Kotlin code before I did. But then one day, we got a phone call uh, from people we didn't work with uh, on the Android side. And they, they wanted to talk to us about this idea of supporting Kotlin as an officially supported language on the Android platform and announcing that at Google I.O. 2017, which was three months uh, from that call. So it was pretty clear that the timeline was very short. We were incredibly excited. This is what we wanted all along. It happened in the spring 2017. It was already a year that Colin was out. And yeah, it was an exciting moment, but we realized it was a huge amount of work uh, to get it done by uh, the conference. And that was the most intense period, I think, in my, in my, in my career at JetBrains. It was just like a... It was a roller coaster of up and downs. Uh, that it was also one of the most exciting periods, and we can't say anything to anyone. Like even inside JetBrains, it was limited to maybe like I don't know, five, six people. I think it was really hard to get everything ready on time, especially with the foundation and with the trademarks. They were, I think, uh, Max and Edry had to like cancel and reschedule their flights to Mountain View, a couple of, to San Francisco, a couple of times, while the discussions were ongoing. Like, are we doing this? Are we not doing this? Are we announcing that? Are we announcing this later? This was this was frustrating. If you think about the position Google was in back then, it's it's a pretty difficult position because the this famous lawsuit that uh, Oracle started against Google for using Java was still going on. So we've, as, as Google, uh, we've used another company's language before and see what happened. We d- really don't want anything like that happening again. Conspiracy theories are are all over the place, right? I mean, and the, and the best place to find conspiracy theories is Hacker News or Reddit. And so when I look at some of the, every time there's some news or something around Kotlin or whatever, or someone writes some blog post about Kotlin, the first comment is always, oh yes, Kotlin was created by Google because they wanted to avoid any legal issues with Java and Oracle. You know, like this, 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 this is so far from the truth. So what can we do? And it was a, difficult process of figuring out the kind of legal things we need to uh, sign, like the kind of arrangement we need to set up. And uh, basically, this is when the blueprint for the Kotlin Foundation was drafted. So the idea was that uh, nobody controls uh, Kotlin on its own. Google and GenBrains are partnering in a foundation. The foundation will hold the trademark. And uh, this is how Kotlin will be governed. So, you know, neither Google nor JetBrains owns Kotlin as a trademark. For example, there's a language committee in the tra- in the foundation, which doesn't decide what features are going in the language, but does have uh, a say over what breaking changes may or may not occur. And then there is a very important question of how do you govern the foundation? Like what's uh, what the board of directors is like? How does uh, voting work on the board and so on and so forth? And uh, it was a like long legal document describing the voting procedures and the kinds of decisions that required simple majority and kinds of decisions that required supermajority, like two thirds of the board or something. And 
you know, every time you change something in this kind of document, you need to check that everything else is consistent. And this is what we, uh, like myself and uh, my closest colleague, Stas Yerohin, were doing together on a whiteboard, debugging this algorithm, like, what if this happens? Like, and this party votes like this, and that party votes like this. Is it a problem? Is it okay? And we went through at least three rounds of this, I think. So it was pretty intense. It was emotionally difficult because there was a lot of things, details that had to be sorted out. How do we release uh, new versions now that uh, we have to integrate with Android Studio? Officially, we used to integrate on our side, but there were a lot of issues. And I think, <laughs> I think it was then. Yeah, I think it was then that like the actual uh, the actual release of the the actual build of the Android plugin that went into the first public version of Android Studio with Kotlin support. I think I compiled this version like at one a.m. lying in my bed in Saint Petersburg apartment, just like on my laptop, and then sent it over by email to someone, and then went into the first build. So how do we figure out the release process? Well, what goes into the announcement? You know, and all that was going on at the same time, and we had a hard deadline. One day it would be like, we're not going to make it because we need to agree on this and uh, we don't have time and it's not feasible. Sitting in a room with Dave Burke, uh, who leads uh, Android Engineering, and Dave was quiet as we walked through all of the uh, data end to end. And he said at the end, on the one hand, this is a pretty big deal. On the other hand, this looks like an absolute no brainer. Do you think we can pull it off for IO? And then two days later, you know, folks getting on a call again and saying, no, look, we got to fix this. We got to make it happen. And we got to, we got to find our way around it. And we got to do something to make this happen. And so it was really a time that both Google and JetBrains, we just didn't want to give up. We really wanted to make it happen. And the last bit was that uh, Mark Shafir actually overnight flew to California to talk to uh, Google's vice president to uh, just face to face to establish a like personal relationship of trust because it was like signing papers is one thing, but like looking at a person is another thing, and it worked. One more thing. One thing we think would be an incredible compliment to the story, and it is one thing our team has never done for developers. We have never added a new programming language to Android, and today we're making Kotlin an officially supported language in Android. So. so Kotlin. Colin is what our developer community has already asked for. It makes developers so much more productive. It is fully Android runtime compatible. It is totally interoperable with your existing code. It has fabulous IDE support. And it's mature and production ready from day one. And Google I.O. 2017 is a day I'll never forget. There was this announcement, the developer keynote, that Colin has introduced to the Android platform. There was a huge ovation, and we were there uh, in the amphitheater with Max, and it was incredible in terms of feeling the energy, feeling that it's actually happened. Uh, yeah, it was great. They didn't invite Max on the stage. They should have. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't there back then. I perfectly remember this day. I was, we were, me and the rest of the team were watching this from the office, uh, live uh, translation. It was really, really exciting. It was, again, still one of the brightest memory of my uh, years working at Cotton. <laughs> I do remember. So I remember the time that, um, you know, Google announced <laughs> 
uh, that it was supporting Kotlin. And that was a huge relief for me personally, because, you know, I kind of bet the startup I was working at on Kotlin. <laughs> and so the moment Google came out and said, this is our new language, I was like, okay, phew, right? Now, now that's like the seal of approval. No one else going to argue about this anymore. Um, you know, that was a bet that paid off. And uh, it was great to see because I had sort of assumed that Google would do something dumb, like go off and make their own language. Uh, you know, that Google have made so many languages, I was sort of expecting them to, to not do that. Uh, so it was really uh, fantastic to see that the Android team you know, recognized something good when they saw it and, you know, took that suggestion basically from their community. I missed the keynote for IO because I, at the time of the keynote, I was on a plane flying over. And I remember landing in Vancouver to connect to, uh, to San Francisco. And, uh, you know, I, I went through immigration and I, I tweeted, I said, so did I miss anything? Because I knew what had happened, right? And everyone was like replying to me on Twitter. Oh my God, you know, congratulations and this and that. When Google made the, the announcement, you know, we previously, a few months before, we had launched the idea of doing a, a conference called Kotlin Conf. And I think by that time, we had sold like 150 tickets. And we were aiming for about 1,000 people, optimistically. And I remember after the announcement, uh, the Kotlin Conf uh, tickets were almost sold out, <laughs> or very were sold out really fast, because we were planning Kotlin Conf conference, the first Kotlin Conf conference in San Francisco. And uh, yeah, I remember the stories that yeah, after the announcement, <laughs> the sales plunged up. Obviously, everyone was uh, instantly surprised. It's like, what's what it is Kotlin? What it is all about? And so. On. And then from there, it suddenly, you know, we, we sold out. I mean, every Kotlin comp we sold out. And then Coursera coming and other publishers coming and saying, yes, please, we want more content on Kotlin. And then we saw an, uh, an influx of, of books being published and courses. Now we have this huge problem <laughs> after so It was very helpful for us that Google adopted Kotlin on Android and make it the later default language for Android and supports it very much. But uh, as a consequence of this is that many people would say that Kotlin is now for mobile only, for Android only, and that's it. Yes, this is our problem that uh, for instance, I and my team uh, struggle very much uh, with and uh, try to um, to reinforce uh, the community that uh, the language uh, has never been only for Android. Yes, we have many Android users and a lot of high probably is more connected with Android, but there are also a lot of server side users. It's not just about people using your tool anymore, but it's like you have actually created an entire ecosystem and are contributing to other people benefiting from this ecosystem, not just from building things with the language, but in doing courses, training, consulting. I was one time in, in India and uh, a person came up to me and, and they said, we were doing this event in India and they, they, came, they came up to me and they said, you know, I... I was, I was out of work. I, I had no understanding of software development or anything. And I watched your talk from Google I.O. about this thing called Kotlin. It got me interested. I started to learn con Kotlin. And now I have a job and I can provide for my family. Right. And this, like, really, I think is more fulfilling than anything else that you could measure as a result of your work in that you actually see that what you have done has positively impacted other people's lives. Actually, one, one of the hardest things about this time was uh, I was like overly stressed, like terribly stressed. And I didn't feel like, it felt like everything could fall apart at any moment. I didn't feel like Colin was really ready for from the technical side. I didn't feel I was performing well enough. You know, it was, it was pretty terrible in terms of uh, the tension and pressure and, and everything. And I remember before going to California, I was, I just noticed that in the mornings, I am sad every day. Like I don't want to go to work 
because uh, of all the pressure. And so this moment, the announcement did help with that a little bit. But what helped even more was that uh, Stephanie, being an incredibly nice person, arranged a series of meetings with Google engineers for me, I think right after a conference. I think so. Or maybe right before, I don't remember. But it was a whole day packed with meetings with high-profile Google engineers. And every person in every meeting told me how much they liked Kotlin. And, you know, in the beginning, my, my imposter syndrome was like, okay, they're just saying nice things because they're nice people. There's also the American culture to say nice things all the time. Uh, and I wasn't believing. But then, uh, you know, talking engineer to engineer, you start going into technical details. And they were telling me about things they were playing with in Kotlin. It was like very believable that they actually liked it. And by the end of the day, it was a very strong feeling that very good engineers actually liked what we did there. And this is when I felt much better. So all this pressure, all of this, uh, you know, tension, anxiety, and all this very hard work paid off. We did something that people actually like. It was a big relief. I remember I have this flashback memory of me walking outside of the office somewhere in Mountain View and thinking that, yeah, all of these people can't be just nice. No, they do like it, for real. And where do you see Kotlin in 10 years? Oh, in 10 years, Kotlin is going to be multi-platform. Here's how you can make a rotating donut in Kotlin. And what looks so magical all becomes clear once you understand the math behind it. In January, the Kotlin multi-platform team updated the web wizard for multi-platform projects. Now you can easily add various popular libraries and greater plugins to a new project. And what is the best feature of Kotlin? Oh, yeah, it's uh, no safety, of course. I mean, it really uh, reduces uh, lots of bugs in your code, and it's in what made Kotlin great, and it's still the greatest. What's the coolest thing you ever developed in Kotlin? A peer-to-peer -peer payments integration. We are working on the, the hardware terminal. Yeah. yeah, which is quite a unique opportunity. Software for broadcasting, so that with Kotlin in production, so that's cool. An app for frontline workers so that every employee is connected to their company. Under apps, I worked on SolarLearn, currently working in Klarna, but Klarna app. It's just like a small recipe app I developed on my own in the beginning. What's it called? Um, a cookie recipe. <laughs> I started by micromanaging a team of initially maybe five people, and then it grew to 30 something. And it was very difficult and uh, I, was doing a job I didn't know how to do. And it required a lot of effort from me and a lot of effort uh, in like just overcoming this feeling of being incompetent all the time. So I, I felt fairly confident as an engineer and very inconfident as a manager. Over time, of course, I learned how to do management, but that took a big toll. And I got really, really tired and burned out over that. So I worked in Kotlin for 10 years. And it felt like a good point where I could, uh, like I did address all the management problems, all, all the main management problems uh, that we accumulated over, over the years. And everything was in relative order. And it felt like a good moment to just step aside and take a break. So this is what I did in 2020. You know, when Andre left, I was concerned, honestly. Um, there's, you know, the industry is very oriented around programming languages that have had very stable long-term leadership, right? Ido Van Rossum was involved in Python for decades. And, you know, if you look at Ruby or, you know, even Java, the, the, the Java leadership has been extremely stable over very long periods of time. And Kotlin, to me, it felt was still quite young. Uh, and suddenly Andre is leaving. So, and there wasn't really a clear explanation as to why, right? Was he tired of Kotlin? Did he no longer believe in it? Was it personal? Um, you know, it, it seemed like such a great position for him to be in. You know, the, the way we set everything up when I was leaving was a very, very smooth tr transition. So we 
uh, had a decision-making procedure for the design, for everything, and it just kept going after I left. And then it evolved somehow without me. And I was not involved very much with anything, basically, after uh, late 2020. And we do chat with people uh, on the Colin team just socially, uh, like these people. I worked with them for a long time. And I enjoy that, but uh, they don't need me to keep Gotham going. I'm not sure that uh, community was that much pushed back uh, when Andrew left, just because the new Roman Elizar who stepped in, uh, because Roman was already super famous for his coroutines contributions and uh, mostly coroutines, the way they were, they are in the language now were his ideas. Ten years is a big time for a person to be on a single thing, so. Uh, people get uh, tired of uh, doing. Uh, uh, he, first of all, it's not this you know single project for the whole life person. So, I mean, uh, sometimes you, you you have to do something something new. And my decision to leave was completely personal. Had I would have loved to continue working. I'm a different kind of person than Breslov. I I can I I will, I can do lifetime projects. And I do have lifetime projects. I have projects that I've been working on more than 20 years of my life. Uh, so, but I mean, there was personal circumstances that forced me to leave. So now uh, people might ask about, okay, what, <laughs> it's like, what's happening <laughs> with you folks? Why you have uh, the other lead also leaving? But yeah, Roman also his, uh, had his reasons uh, not connected uh, with Kotlin. Yeah, and I think that now uh, Kotlin is at the stage where the the whole team of developers working, the whole team of people working, not only developers, but everyone is quite strong. And uh, there are many very talented people. I'm I'm not worried. I had some uh, discussions with someone recently about it. But yeah, I'm on the side that is not worried uh, about the future because just uh, one or another person left. <laughs> My name is uh, Igor Tolstoy. I joined JetBrains in 2019 as a product manager. Uh, and I started uh, in the Kotlin team. So I initially joined the Kotlin team. Uh, my work as a product manager was, if I want to describe it in one sentence, it is understanding what Kotlin developers need and what we must do for them in order to have success. Uh, right now, I am managing the whole Kotlin team, which means that I am responsible. I'm still responsible for product management, but I am also responsible for like managing the team, processes, and delivery. When I joined, Kotlin was uh, divided into smaller sub teams, like team a team that develop Kotlin native, Kotlin JVM, Kotlin JS build tools and other things, it's still the same. But at that time, each team decided what to work on mostly on their own. And that led to some unpleasant issues. For example, lots of different prototypes that were created by different teams, not supported by other teams, and uh, not worked out. Uh, for example, when you create a new language feature, it's not just it's not enough to support it just in compiler. You have to also provide a great IDE support for it. Otherwise, it won't be convenient to use. Uh, when I joined, the teams were quite disconnected, and there were lots of such cases when a new feature is created and is not supported in tooling. I think we did really great in learning how to work together. So. I can say that we became more like from a very, very startup like team, we became more enterprise like team. It's quite hard to work on a startup mode on a product that has millions of users who really, really rely on how uh, stable it is. Before it, Kotlin was mostly JVM language. Uh, 
very tightly bounded to the JVM platform. Now, Kotlin multi-platform, which was a prototype when I joined, is like a fully featured product that is adopted by huge companies in the industry, like Netflix, Square, Google, um, McDonald's, uh, and other companies. And Kotlin is right now much more than just a JVM language. Many developers and companies literally share 100% or 80% of their code bases across Android, iOS, and backend. That's really awesome, and that's like an entirely new life for Kotlin. We really believe that our whole industry is flawed right now. Just think about it. Uh, every company in the world hires a team of Android developers, a team of iOS developers, a team of front-end developers who essentially write the very same business logic. They just write it because at some point of time, different companies who hold these platforms decided that they want to, that they want to have their own technical stack. That's like complete nonsense. That's so many human, uh, human resources, so many people's lives thrown at literally nothing. What we believe is that Kotlin can become a language that bounds together different ecosystems and allows you not to write repetitive code once and once again. In that sense, we won't be just another new cross-platform solution because there are tons of them, like, I don't know, React Native or Flutter that are very great frameworks. Uh, we are unlike them. Uh, what those frameworks tell you? They tell you, uh, hey, we're one more competing standard. You can just take Dart and write a beautiful Flutter application. Yes, you really can do it, but that's just the new ecosystem. What we are doing is uh, we are designing Kotlin, Kotlin tooling and all frameworks in such a way that they will be very interoperable with different ecosystems, like Kotlin was in Java. Right now, it's the same, we're doing the same with Kotlin and iOS. We make Kotlin uh, integration in existing iOS projects as smooth as possible. We believe that we will achieve the same uh, in web with uh, WebAssembly. Uh, we are making a huge bet on WebAssembly and we believe that it will grow and Kotlin will be a major player there and that it will also allow us to uh, fulfill this dream on this front as well. So basically, that's our vision for, for the Kotlin right now is Looking back on the 10 years working on Kotlin, I can, uh, well, I'm 100% sure it was a very good idea to actually work on this project. It was risky, it was wild, but it was a very good idea. So I'm, I'm really happy with how Kotlin turned out as a product. I think it helps a lot of people and this is the ultimate goal of uh, any product. I think I did learn a lot and uh, Next time I do a big project, I will be doing it differently and I will be hopefully much happier doing it. But uh, I have no regrets in terms of uh, have I, uh, sh sh should I have done it or not? I should. I should have. And I'm happy I have. It really reminds me of one of the comments that I received from a thought leader. They came to me one day and uh, they had invited me to this conference. And uh, they, they said to me that, uh, you know, come and speak at this conference here, yeah, come and give a talk about Kotlin. And I did. I went, I gave a talk about Kotlin. And uh, afterwards I said, so what do you think? And they said, I think JetBrains should stick to IDEs. Languages is not for them. And I said, but why? Well, because you do tooling. I said, but how is a language not a tool? Well, no, a language is different. Why? A language is a tool, period. That's all it is. 